Welcome all. We are just giving everybody a little bit more time to settle in on their virtual chairs and uh, get ready for our meeting. So bear with us a little longer when everyone gets settled in. Okay, let's begin. So firstly, welcome everybody for uh, joining us this evening. We're having lots of these fantastic Arise meetings and they're still very popular. Arise is an online festival of Labour Left ideas uh, and it's been going for several weeks now and it's it's been fantastic. Tonight's meeting is called Lessons from a Pandemic and NHS Privatisation staff shortages and underfunding and i'm your chair this evening and i'm tom griffiths from keep our nhs public so obviously we're going through uh, a major crisis at the moment and it really lays bare all of the things that have been wrong with the nhs and the way it's been uh, looked after or not looked after by this government for a long time uh, and it's not just a lack of preparedness uh, around this crisis. It is systemic inequalities. It is underfunding that's been going on for 10 years, and that's wholly unnecessary underfunding. It is wholly unnecessary privatisation and fragmentation as well, which has left the NHS in a woeful state of preparedness rather than simply just an ineptitude on the part of our leaders. Um, it is... For that reason, the Keeper NHS Public and lots of the other NHS campaigns are campaigning around a very simple slogan at the moment, which is simply, our NHS deserves better. And uh, some of the panellists and myself will talk again later about the events we've got coming up beginning of July for the NHS anniversary about that. But that is enough from me. So we've got a fantastic uh, panel this evening. Uh, we are joined by Lara McNeil, uh, Labour NEC youth rep and also junior doctor herself, uh, Dr Sonia Adesera from Keeper NHS Public as well, uh, John Lister, who is also involved with Keeper NHS Public, who's also Health Campaigns Together and is the editor of a fantastic online journal called The Lowdown. And there's a huge amount of brilliant analysis going on on that site if you're not aware of it already on what's happening to the NHS so I urge you to check it out and last of course Laura Smith crew councillor and former MP uh, who were very sad to have lost in that role uh, at the end of last year and uh, she will round up for us so I'm going to ask each speaker to speak for about eight minutes each uh, and then we'll do some rounds of questions now this meeting is streaming live on facebook and on the arise uh youtube channel as well so you can check it out in those places if if you're uh if you're not already there and you can share of course if you're on facebook to your own facebook uh profile and then loads more people can watch it too okay so, without further ado, our first speaker is Lara McNeil. So, over to you. Thank you so much, Tom, um, and thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be talking about um, such an important subject. Um, at this time, obviously, everyone's talking about health in the NHS, but it's really important that we as a left talk about um, the political uh, underpinning of this whole crisis, and we're not afraid to do so. Um, so thanks to everyone who organised today. Uh, so yeah, as was said, I am uh, an NEC member of the Labour Party, so um, I represent 100,000 young members, um, which is a, a massive privilege. and. Um, we're doing a lot um, in terms of uh, political education and lots of virtual things during this crisis. Um, and also I am a junior doctor, I'm just qualified. Um, I was one of the, the fifth year medical students who was sort of uh, accelerated through the last few months. So my graduation should have been in two weeks, but I've been a doctor for about three months now um, over this crisis. Um, so I just want to talk quickly about my, my sort of experience um, over this crisis and in the NHS, what COVID has shown us about healthcare, what, what, you know, what does after the crisis look like, 
and what we should be calling for uh, as the left, um, what, what should be our role in this debate. Um, so yeah, in, in terms of my experience, obviously this has been a challenging time for everyone. I think everyone's made sacrifices in their own way. From a, a sort of doctor healthcare perspective, I think one of the saddest things is seeing patients not being able to visit their families in hospital, whether they've got COVID or, or not. Um, and it, it's really changed how a whole hospital is run and, and it's affected everyone. Obviously we're seeing the deaths from COVID, which pe people are sort of forgetting are still happening. Um, you know, and we're quite possibly we'll have a second wave. Um, and yeah, I think it's been really hard for healthcare workers who have um, sort of had to come in and put themselves at risk and hearing the stories in the news about obviously people have uh, died from this uh, just in their place of work. And that's extremely scary. I think the crisis has obviously hit working class people the most. We've seen uh, the reports of Bain people being hit the hardest by this virus. Um, and this is because of the, the social situation that we live in and the inequality that has been allowed to run rife in this country. Um, I think it's been really humbling to see NHS staff come together. But as the left, we know that it's not just about being nice and coming together. It means demanding changes in the system, which actually mean that uh, doctors, healthcare workers um, uh, get the terms and conditions and the work environments that keep them safe. So, the Tories have obviously set this, uh, this wartime narrative, which sets the scene perfectly for this inevitable loss of life. Um, but we know that this could have been prevented. Those healthcare workers that lost their life and the over 40,000 people that have lost their life in the UK, those deaths could have been prevented if our healthcare had been prepared and decision, if our healthcare system had been prepared, sorry, and decisions had been taken earlier. Coronavirus was not inevitable. Pandemic planning should have been thought of. Warnings were ignored and our public services are running on absolutely no slack to survive under pressure. There's, you know, I, I feel even, I don't know if Sonia feels the same, but often you feel like you can't properly speak out about situations that are going on in your own hospital because, you know, of multiple reasons. But the, the reality is um, that people are not getting tested when they need to. PPE isn't always available. And these things are preventable things um, which we could have approached better as a country. And that requires politics. We're always told that, you know, don't politicize a crisis. That this crisis is political. The way it's been handled is political. And the way that we were not prepared for it as a country is political. And so COVID has just uh, exposed holes that were already there in our health and social care system. And we have seen from the public, you know, this outpouring of love for the NHS, the clap for carers. I mean, it was actually very lovely when it got going, but I was quite skeptical at first because I, I thought it kind of bought into an idea that um, all we have to do is show our appreciation through these, these means and not have wider and bigger demands. You could argue the NHS is top of the agenda now and it will prevent the success of outwardly anti-NHS political movements, but that's not what's happening. The NHS was one of the, you know, obviously Brexit took the, the headlines, but the NHS is still what people vote on, you know, given their top issues. And still we have a conservative government. So something is not getting through here. And it's because the conservatives have these uh, underhand policies, you know, short of the public being actually charged for healthcare. Um, they've benefited from having this apolitical love of the NHS, which means they can just privatize it through the back door. So for us as the left, it's so important that we challenge that and say, no, this is political and this is why, because otherwise the NHS is just falling apart in front of our eyes and we are letting it happen. Obviously, Labour has some blame historically for this. We lost the original values of the NHS. And when we've been in government, obviously the Tories always deal with the NHS worse whenever it's in our hands. But this cross-party consensus uh, de developed when New Labour um, came in and supported PFI, private finance initiatives, and allowed the process of privatisation and reorganisation to occur at alarmingly fast rates. And this just meant there was less opposition in years later. Even Conservatives have said they're surprised what Labour did when they were in government. So we have some blame in this historically, and it's up for us on the left to make sure that Labour is never in that position again. And we are always fighting for a publicly funded and owned NHS, social care system and the rest. So I think going 
forward obviously we need to look at what we do when we come out of this crisis i really hope there won't be a second wave but i'm not very confident um i think there's an alarming amount of outstanding um you know medical work so uh, a backlog of cases that are non-covid which is really scary and i'm sure lots of us will know you know people where that's, they haven't started cancer treatment that has been delayed um there, there was a, a doctor who who told me that they think heart attacks have halved in, in the hospital they were at. And we know heart attacks haven't halved. That just meant people were not coming in when they needed the help because they were very scared of going to hospital. And, and still people are scared of going into hospital when obviously it is a risk. So we're going to have this backlog of, of cases, which I don't think the NHS is fully equipped to deal with. I think one of the biggest holes we saw was the staffing levels in the NHS. Um, you know, you have the general stories like people can't get annual leave because, uh, you know, in normal times, because there's not enough cover, et cetera. And then with almost a third of the workforce going off sick, it just exposed how low staffing levels are and how much we're relying on people to never get sick, never have annual leave and all this stuff, which is not how healthcare workers should work. Um, and, you know, we've seen the Tories cut nursing bursaries, so we have less nurses we're recruiting. Um, people are leaving the profession because of the lack of confidence um, and, you know, how bad it is necessary, like to be a healthcare worker in this country. So I think we're going to see some problems that the left has to have responses to. And I don't think that the Labour Party should just be criticising the Conservatives as they go. I think that um, we should be having a plan uh, of what we're going to do and that, requires us to say uh this is what we would have done differently but also we're going to make sure that working people don't pay for this crisis um i think we're yet to see the worst of coronavirus which is actually you know the austerity and um and the inequality which is going to flourish if we don't get the toys out of government as soon as possible and we need to be, be prepared for that with a post-crisis plan as the labor party and i don't think we have a clear enough plan at the moment i think we're just criticizing the government uh when they say things rather than actually setting out an alternative um and i'm just gonna i think i've, I've lost track of how long i'm going on but i'm just gonna mention one thing which i think is really important and that is um social care and i think we need to be focusing on this as the left as well we've seen social care be such an issue in this crisis we already have a social care crisis um you know the privatized and fragmented system is not working it's not putting patient care first it's uh meaning that people are bed blocking in hospitals people aren't having dignity at the end of their life or in a vulnerable situation and COVID has gone through care homes at alarming rates people haven't been able to get the care because of the situation and I really worry that we're losing the National Social Care Service sort of um, policy as a Labour Party. And I think that will be the, something that we have to fight for in the next, um, in the coming months. So, yeah, I would just uh, end it on social care, social care, social care. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Laura. That's a fantastic introduction. Uh, and of course, social care will undoubtedly come up again. And it is, of course, uh, horrific to see what's been happening in care homes around the country. Our next speaker is Dr. Sonia Adesera from Keep Our NHS Public and lots of other things, and a fantastic campaigner who I'm glad to say I know very well. And so I'm sure this will be great. Over to you. Thanks, Tom. You're very unfortunate to know me very well. <laughs> but thanks, um, thanks for having me. Thanks for everyone that's tuned in. Um, and yeah, I think just, you know, following on, I agree with everything. Um, that Lara said there, I think her analysis of what happened um, over the past few weeks and the past few months has been spot on. Um, and yeah, you know, I feel so privileged to work in the NHS. And, you know, despite all the things that we're going to talk about in this meeting and the underfunding and the staff shortages and the privatisation, despite all that, you know, our NHS manages to provide, you know, compassionate care to millions of people every week. Um, and actually what the NHS has achieved is despite everything over the past few weeks to cope with this crisis, I think it's been really remarkable. We need to take stock of that. Um, however, I think um, as we are recovering from this crisis and as we are you know, considering how we build back a better system, I think we need to you know, acknowledge the, the flaws and the, um, the imperfections of our healthcare system. Um, and I think as Laura just you know, spoke about at the end there, it was, you know, it was such a surreal thing in the first few weeks of this crisis when we were, you know, seeing the headlines and all the media focusing on these like big new hospitals being built with all the fancy ventilators. And at that very same time, we had hundreds of thousands of our most 
vulnerable people in our communities literally being left to die in care homes. Um, and I think that's just epitomised the relationship that we have um, between, you know, a lot of the time, all the focus is on the acute care, um, and yet social care in this country has been shamefully neglected now for decades um, by, by both political parties in this country. Um, and I think, you know, our NHS rightly has um, a, central, a central role in British society, and rightly so, but I think, you know, too often um, our NHS has failed to use its, its institutional power to, um, for the betterment of society. And actually too often um, our healthcare system simply mirrors the, um, the very worst of the inequalities and the injustices that exist in our society. So we have a very, you know, in most trusts that you work in, you'll have people on Three figure salaries um, with nice paid holiday leave, working literally next to someone who is on a zero hours contract, barely getting paid enough to survive. Um, we have our NHS since its inception was re completely reliant on migrant labour. We actually invited migrants from the, from, um, from the empire to come and work here. And yet, still today, these migrant workers are treated as second class, right? They're treated as simply here to fill, fill workforce gaps. And they're not even, not even given the right for them and their families to use the service that they work in. Um, and you know, this virus, as, as Lara said, you know, has shown a spotlight on the, on the disparities, on the health disparities that exist between racialized groups in this country. We've seen that black and ethnic minorities are dying in much greater numbers. Um, but again, this is not new. The NHS, we've known about disparities between racialized groups across, across the healthcare service for decades now in the NHS, and that's across the whole healthcare service. So we know that ethnic minorities have poor health outcomes, high maternal mortality, high infant mortality, poor experience of cancer care, later diagnosis of cancer care, poor, poor experiences in elderly care and general practice. So across the healthcare system, we have known about these disparities. Um, the recommendations that were put out in the PHE document yesterday, again, have been in the literature for four, <laughs> almost 20 years now, and yet, you know, there has been just a complete failure of intention by our national health leadership to address these inequalities. Um, and I think most shamefully for me, um, our NHS has colluded with the politics of xenophobia. So we have allowed the hostile environment to be introduced into our healthcare service. We have allowed, um, well, forced health workers to become border guards. Um, we've introduced racial profiling into our NHS. And you know, by doing so, the NHS has legitimised the idea that migrants are just not deserving of that basic human right of healthcare like the rest of us. Um, and of course, it, it, the past few weeks has happened, but again, for many years, we know that migrants have died as a result of these policies. But also, you know, in the context of the discussion, um, you know, as Laura said, that the, the NHS is loved and that principle of universality um, having healthcare for all free at the point of need. There's been, you know, poll after poll to show that the British public are grossly, massively in support of this. And yet through this smoke of xenophobia um, and anti-migrant narrative, we have allowed the introduction of charging mechanisms into our NHS, opening the doors to privatization with, you know, very little, you know, public or media outrage. And I think that's something we really need to consider. And also, I'm just going to touch on outsourcing, and I think this, I know this is something that is going to be discussed more by some of the other speakers. Um, and of course, we know that it's, it undermines the values and the principles of NHS, it's poor patient care, but I also want to talk about it and how it treats NHS workers. Um, so I talked about before about this huge, um, you know, quite <laughs> gross levels of, you know, inequality of we have between workers in the NHS. And you know, I think often when we're talking about workers and issues, we're thinking about doctors and nurses and, um, you know, I think we'd all of us like a pay rise. But actually, if we think about our conditions compared to most of the people that work in the NHS, if we're looking at our cleaners, our catering staff, our transport drivers, um, um, the huge, huge, huge parts of the workforce have been outsourced to the private sector. Um, many of these people are on really low paid, insecure contracts. And the coronavirus has showed, actually, that... Um, Many of them don't have 
are not able to have sick pay, are not able to take leave when they need to. Um, and we know that there's been high, higher death rates amongst these worker staff. And if you look at social care staff compared to you know, clinical staff, their, their numbers of deaths during this virus have been significantly higher. And yet, yet still right now, right now in Homerton Hospital, where my sister works, um, the cleaners there are in dispute with Serco, who is their, their private employer, who's trying to impose on them a contract that will not allow them to have statutory sick pay for the next five years. So despite everything that's happened, um, and I think we need to be, be thinking about how the outsourcing has really made it very difficult for these workers to unionize, to um, have collective solidarity. And I think we need to be, that should be part of our thinking of why it's so important that we bring um, all parts of the NHS back, in, back into having a nationalized healthcare service um, and stopping this outsourcing and privatization, which, didn't just happen under the Tories, by the way, it's something we'll see to bear in mind. Um, and then I think, you know, just, just to finish, um, we have to learn the lessons from this pandemic, um, but also we need, to, we need to reflect and learn how the political class responded to the last crisis. Um, because we know, that, we know that austerity hit hardest and harmed the health of those that are most deprived of in our society, that of people of colour, of, of, the, of the working classes. And, and because of those policies, it is meant that those very same people have been disproportionately hit by the burden of COVID. And that's the economic burden and you know, the mortality burden. Um, so we need to be thinking about, we need to bear that in mind and think about how we respond to this crisis. And then also, this is gonna seem a little bit, you know, at odds with, with the conversation that we're having today, but. You know, over the past decade, the NHS has suffered you know, severe funding shortages and we can't go back to the situation that we're in before. Like we can't go back into having, you know, six hour a and &E waiting times, which was the norm where I used to work. But also, I think we need to think about like when it comes to the funding cuts over the past 10 years, you could argue that the NHS itself was actually more protected under austerity funding cuts compared to other parts of the state. So if we're looking at social care, local government, our welfare system, our educational system, these had severe, severe funding cuts. And actually, if you look at this government, this Cummings government, um, and the last election promises, they're quite happy to put out these big funding promises for big buildings and, you know, for, you know, new A&Es, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But actually, they would do so whilst continuing to dismantle parts of the state, which are crucial to the health of those that are most disadvantaged in our society. So as we go forward and as we are thinking about, um, as we're thinking about what our campaign is, we need to be thinking that health justice needs to be at the core of our movement going forward. Um, and yes, we need a fully funded, fully socialized health and care services, but we also need to be thinking about the economic and the social and the political system that we live in and how we dismantle these systems of oppression that allow everyone in our society to live fulfilling um, and healthy lives and to their potential. That's me done. Thanks, Tom. Fantastic, Sonia. Health is a human right. And thank you as well for talking about Homerton and uh, union issues. Uh, of course, you know, the, there have been some victories there in Lewisham uh, with the GMB, with cleaners, and I know the GMB union are gearing up to that fight that you mentioned there with Serco. And so, you know, uh, comradely greetings to them and, and solidarity from all of us at Arise and Labour Assembly and Keep Our NHS Public and beyond as well. And, you know, to anyone here who isn't uh, in a union, uh, join one today, no excuses. And if you're in a union in the NHS, get involved and support your your fellow members, you know, in disputes, even if they're in different, different areas. Um, next is John Lister. If you've been around NHS campaigning, you'll know the name John Lister. John Lister's been doing this for decades. He is probably the man who knows most about what the government's been doing to the NHS and always has powerful analysis for us all. Um, without further ado, John Lister from Health Campaigns Together. Thanks, Tom. No pressure then. Um, yeah, I, I, obviously, two really good uh, speakers have come before me, but I, I thought I'd try and do it a little bit differently. Uh, I think you could look at the COVID uh, discussion. There's kind of three, three, part, three main parts to it. There's COVID itself and its impact, how it's been treated, PPE and related questions. There's the whole question about the care home sector and so on, which is a whole 
basically a whole extra discussion because there's a whole history going back to Margaret Thatcher of these having been privatised, the whole care sector having been privatised, and, and the, the way that that's now been proved to be a completely unsustainable system. And we do need, I think, uh, a, a, a government, and it could even be this one, actually, because it could all collapse and they might have to take some action. But I think the, the question of a national care service is absolutely basic. Uh, that needs to be providing these services, uh, not on the basis currently of, uh, of, of uh, means tested charges, but free for all uh, the, uh, on, on the basis of need rather than, uh, and funded from taxation like the NHS is. Um, so I think that that's a, a second strand. But the third strand, I think, is also very important, which is, and uh, I think uh, Lara started to touch on this, and I think it's really important, is, is what's happening to the rest of the NHS while all this is going on and what the NHS we're going to have left as the COVID pandemic eventually, one way or the other, is, is brought under some form of control. What we're going to have left and, and how long is it going to take and how are we going to get the NHS back uh, working again? Uh, but I, I, I think the, the, if you go back to the first aspect of it, the COVID impact, uh, possibly the most shocking thing is uh, listening, well, the most shocking thing this morning is listening to Matt Hancock on the Today programme this morning, sounding like he was on cocaine or something, just completely off his head, just going on about what a brilliant success they'd made of the whole thing, and they were winning and whatever. And then you look at today's figures, 184 people dead, right? 184 people dead in the most recent. Now, this is like an average airliner crashing once a day we're getting. It's only just come below 200. 200 accepted as a triumph that we've got it down to 200 people a day dying and you think of the toll of human misery that actually represents you look at the actual toll in the nhs over well over 300 health and care professionals now and, and staff have actually lost their lives large proportion of those black and ethnic minority staff uh, but 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 you know the, the terrible toll 90 percent of the doctors who've died black and ethnic minority doctors. This is a terrible, terrible toll that's being taken. And any government that comes along at this stage and says, oh, we're winning, it's all brilliant, is just completely out of, out of space. It is just not, not, not really relating to the real world at all. And the reality is that we've actually got now a death to excess death toll since this all started in the region of 65,000 excess deaths. The official death toll is 42,000. That alone is just, you know, we're looking at the equivalent of World War II blitzes. You know, we're talking really cosmically large numbers here. So I, I, we have to start to look at that. And then we have to start to look at the extent to which privatization has actually made things worse during this whole process. So we had at the beginning, we had the big scandal over PPE, right, which should have been there because there should have been a pandemic plan. Johnson scrapped the pandemic committee that should have been planning the things, and the, the previous governments disregarded the warnings that there wasn't put the preparations in place. When they turned to the stockpile, they found most of it was out of date. Not a lot of it was, wasn't there at all. And then they started panic buying and all over, all over the place. And we're now discovering more and more of these mad contracts that were given out, rather like Chris Grayling and his ferry company with no ferries. We've had a, a pest control company be given £108 million to buy PPE. You know, with no apparent record, a, a pest control company with 16 employees and an address in a residential property actually given 108 million pounds to go and buy PPE. That's the kind of mad, mad, crazy stuff that happens to try to actually cover over the cracks. We've got the supply chain that's supposed to actually handle the PPE. Turns out to be privatised a second time under the Tories two years ago, uh, 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 beginning of last year, and it's a complete and utter disaster in terms of the, the, its delivery. Then they tried to reorganize it, bringing the army in, they couldn't make it work. Then they brought in a czar and that couldn't make it work. And in the end, they've had to set up a further supply chain, which again has been downgraded in terms of its, its role. This is complete and utter chaos. They started off with one supply chain under NHS logistics in the mid 2000s, privatized it under the new Labour government, privatized it, gave it all to DHL. It's now been subdivided into 12 different contracts. Unipar with some Japanese style mumbo jumbo about, about uh, Kaizen and God knows what is actually trying to run this thing with the whole thing about the Unipart way, which is, appears to be nobody gets any PPE, but you don't get to blame anybody because you've got 12 different contracts. This is, this is completely irresponsible. It's made life worse for NHS employees and it's fragmented and disorganized a system that was previously relatively functional. Uh, we look at the testing regime. Instead of setting up a proper testing, looking to the people who know about testing and who have got the expertise, the NHS and also the local government, public health people, they turn instead to bring in Deloitte's to run it and then a whole series of contractors to actually deliver it. 
and all these car parks are converted to deliver these testing services with untrained low wage people uh, actually telling people how to deliver do the test themselves instead of the medical professionals who should be doing it we've got no figures at all as to how many of these uh, tests actually are, are useful or valid tests that are being done even the numbers that we get they won't tell us how many people are being tested because clearly they've got a, a, a something serious they've got to cover up there then you move on to the question of this app that's supposed to be brought in and solve the whole problem of track and trace that still doesn't exist. They've spent millions of pounds. Some mate of Dominic Cummings' friend or something has been given the contract. Again, contracting out uh, something that should actually be developed by NHS Digital and by the people with some knowledge about how, how all this actually works in conjunction with public health professionals. We've got the whole track and trace system itself. Now again, subcontracted via Deloitte to Serco and Serco again bringing people in on minimum wage with one hour's training, online training, and, and then told to go and track and trace. And again, this system's said to be world beating but won't actually be running until the autumn. Meanwhile, they're starting to unlock the whole system and actually send people out on the basis that track and trace is actually up and running, and it clearly isn't. So the private sector is actually undermining the actual possibilities of combating the, 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 the COVID virus. Meanwhile, they say the NHS has coped brilliantly. The NHS has coped brilliantly. I haven't even got onto Nightingale Hospitals. That's a whole other story. The NHS has coped, but it hasn't coped because what you've done is shut down the elective care uh, uh, basically across the country. We've now got a waiting list that has doubled at least since uh, the lockdown started. Uh, a waiting list of now 8 million people. The Royal College of Surgeons reckon it's going to take five years to clear it. And we've now got the NHS sat down saying that the cornerstone of re, 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 uh, in, uh, reviving the NHS is going to be a long-term contract with private hospitals, which in the Financial Times yesterday it was forecast it could be £100 million a week being paid out to private hospitals as part of this programme to actually get, get the NHS back together again. Meanwhile, we've got, in April, there were 37,000 NHS beds closed because of the, the closure of the elective work. 37,000 beds closed. I tried to get hold of uh, the, the up-to-date figures from NHS Improvement today as to how many beds are still closed. They said, oh, we can't give you those figures. Can't give you those figures as, as for management use only. Um, so uh, who knows? But I would guess it's still pretty much 37,000 beds closed. The, the proper resumption of elective work still hasn't begun. Lara referred to the cancer and other patients who have been delayed, had their patient or their, their treatment delay, delayed. But, but the real danger is we can wind up spending hundreds of millions of pounds on private hospitals to tackle a small percentage of the waiting list, while tens of thousands of NHS beds remain closed and remain closed for prolonged periods of time and possibly will never reopen. So I think we've got to have a, a rescue plan here that recognises the need for a full scale investment and which puts right at the centre of it a workplace plan, a workplace plan, the, a, the, a workforce plan, which actually aims to both retain as many as possible of those retired staff who've come in, but also reach out now, new training programmes, rebuild and expand the NHS workforce so that we can have a full scale programme to bring the NHS performance back on track. And I can see my time is up, so I'm going to stop there. I could rant on for hours about it, but it, it, there's so much, there's so much to talk about. That's fantastic, John. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure we'd be happy to, to hear you go on for more as well. Um, <laughs> no, um, I mean, I think you've described in detail the ways in which I like Sonia's phrase earlier of a, the Cummings government. And I think you, John, have explained brilliantly why the Cummings government is, of course, uh, in absolute chaos. Uh, um, and by the way, that figure of the 65,000, uh, that, that's from the Financial Times as well. That's Chris Giles. That is not any left wing headbangers that are using that figure. So, yeah. Um, OK, so uh, just a couple of things before I bring uh, Laura in, who will need no real introduction from me, of course. Um, please do leave us your questions in the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, leave us a question in the comments on Facebook if you're watching there. And likewise, in the comments on YouTube, if that is where you're watching. Uh, so we will take questions for the panel after Laura Smith, councillor from Crew and ex MP, over to you. Hi, Tom, and thank you so, so much. The speakers have been brilliant. Um, I feel like 
ready for a rally after listening uh listening to you then john i'm all fired up it's just a shame that i'm locked inside my house um just to warn you guys we've got like a massive massive lightning storm going on so i'm just hoping i don't get either struck by lightning or cut off uh mid flow so fingers crossed i won't um i just wanted to comment on something that laura said if one more person talks to me about bringing the politics into this situation, I think I'm going to actually just explode because people seem to confuse party politics and politics all the time. And the Tories will let that happen uh, because it suits them to say, oh, you're playing party politics. The fact is, everything is politics and politics is everything and people need to wake up to it because this is about the lives of their loved ones and it's not good enough to say I don't want to get involved in politics anymore. So if you do know people who are saying that, they need a knock on the head now. It's it's time to wake up because things have got so, so bad uh, over the last few months. And I just wanted to say, look, guys, you've probably reached the same point as I have of feeling kind of emotionally battered uh, by life since the general election. And these are incredibly difficult and challenging times for us all, as all the other speakers have said. And I just want to extend my heartfelt solidarity to all of you um, because it is a struggle and it is a struggle to be on the left and, and to keep pushing that. But we must not give up and remember that there is always hope, always hope. Whatever's happened, we move forward and we stand united looking for our social justice. And I loved uh, the, the phrase that Sonia used about health justice. That needs to be put everywhere as far as I'm concerned. That's exactly what we need. Um, so there's much for us all to be doing, to be organising, campaigning. And we need to make sure that every single campaign has a national care service right at the heart of it. And I'm glad that the other speakers touched on it because my background before I was a politician, I was a primary school teacher and then I was kind of a, a school cuts activist and I fell into politics. I literally, I was the person who never thought I could become an MP and somehow managed to rock up there. Um, and then I got booted out after two and a half years, but that's another story. Um, but my thing is this care service and that's where we desperately need to be focusing our attention. And the crisis, it is shown again, just how horrific our care system is and how privatization has destroyed it. It, ha it is, there is no greater example as far as I'm concerned of how uh, rotten privatization is than, than our care service. And it breaks my heart as all of us, it breaks, it breaks my heart to see people who are at, at breaking point um, because of this undignified and broken system. And, you know, this lies on the government. They have had 10 years. They never even produced a social care plan. It got delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. Um, they have a lack of care, a lack of willingness to tackle the social care system. And as far as I'm concerned, that has completely contributed to the horrific amount of deaths that we have sadly seen uh, due to COVID. And I do think that um, a, a large amount of those deaths would have been avoidable. And we have to hold them to account on that. We have to, those people's families deserve that. And however tough it gets now, however much people don't wanna hear it, we need to make sure they are held to account. Um, we've all heard the accounts of COVID patients who have been discharged to care homes, PPE that's inadequate or non-existent, the poverty pay and the zero hours that they reward these key workers. I've been talking to people who's, who work for private care companies whose hours have been taken down to eight hours a week. You know, these are people with two, two three kids. How are they supposed to start on that? And that's basically because the private owners, they don't care. And the privatised care system is catastrophic, unfit and ill-prepared for any such pandemic as this. Um, it was never prepared, and I don't think the government ever to tackle that. It was too big a problem. Um, and it cannot be solved if we stay rooted in profit before care. Now, back in 93, back in 1993, when I was like eight years old, um, I there were 95% of care at home 
was provided by our local authorities. And now almost all of it has been privatised. Um, and even before the pandemic, this system was falling apart. As many care companies, they were unable to balance their books, keep their shareholders happy. Um, you know, and we've seen many providers collapse with disastrous consequences for people and families and workers. And care workers, they have been treated like dirt. When people talk about the working class and they say that time has gone and we don't want to talk about the miners and all the rest of it, care workers are going through exactly the same kind of struggles. It's, ha it's inadequate housing, inadequate pay, and we need to be fighting for these people because it is disgusting. They should be valued 365 days of the year um, and they need to be paid properly. And we can see quite clearly now just how dangerous care homes commercial imperatives have become as the drive to make care profitable and it's created this fragmented incoherent system um, and it's the answer to offshore owners half of the time you know that is disgraceful we need to get these care homes and these care providers back in house and the only way outsourcing can actually save money the only way it does is by undermining the workers who work there that is how they do it. Public service staff who are, who are usually, you know, disproportionately, they are women, uh, they are people of colour, they are migrants, and they're doing important work and they deserve to be treated fairly. So we need to make sure we're bringing those services in-house, making sure those workers have decent terms and conditions and employment. We need to make sure they're in a union. We need to be pushing that people join a union if they haven't already. Now, if there is one thing that we've learned about this pandemic, it is the need for a publicly owned, publicly run national care service. And as I say, every single left campaign needs to have that message um, being pushed. And let's not kid ourselves. Let's not kid ourselves that the Tories are suddenly going to start caring about it. They've been quite, you know, they they like their big announcements where they'll push that they're caring. We saw Matt Hancock doing his U-turn today on um, on Marcus Rashford's um his uh, amazing win and we heard him call him Daniel you know this is this is just how incompetent they are they can't even get the, the guy's name right and um, so we've we've seen this we've, we've seen what their priority is their priority is extra cash for them and extra cash for their mates and getting away with answering as few questions as is humanly possible. Um, testing centres, they are being run by companies such as Serco. Uh, we've got US data companies who are mining our data, you know, and our information. Just by our money, our money. How are people not outraged by this? You know, I don't understand it. We've got to make it. And what the Tories are doing, they're making sure this culture war is rumbling on. So we're all arguing about statues and everything else. And at that time, whilst they're doing that and they're distracting us, they are selling our NHS down the drain because that privatisation is happening now. Um, and that doesn't mean that I am not, you know, I am fully on board with what's happening across this country and the fighting for social justice. But we keep that narrative. Don't let them turn it into um, a faulty towers debate because it's absolute bollocks as far as I'm concerned. And they will do it every single time. Sorry for my language. Um, they've already proved they have no plan. They, they don't want to change anything. They'll go back to the status quo as quickly as possible. They won't be paying our workers more. As far as they were concerned, clapping was was enough. You know, that doesn't put food on anybody's table, however nice and warm makes people feel. And they don't want to answer the questions around um, so many of those working in the NHS and, and in care who have actually lost their lives. Let's not forget about these incredibly high numbers because they weren't provided with the adequate equipment to be able to go into work safely. The handling has been an absolute disaster and it will be scandalous if people don't hold them to account at every possible point. Do not leave it to the politicians because nothing will change. We have to do it as a left movement, fighting for social justice and making sure that people do get the justice that they deserve in this. My time's up, thank you. Yeah. Perfect, brilliant. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I would be hearing applause if we were in real life. That, uh, that was fantastic. Um,
some of the things that uh, keep our NHS public and health campaigns together are calling for in our NHS anniversary events uh, called Our NHS Deserves Better, uh, definitely focusing on social care and ending outsourcing and all of these other things as well. And, um, and of course, highlighting the absolute horror of the inequalities uh, in this. And Gary Young spoke at one of our meetings recently and he said, yes, the police kill black people in this country, but COVID is killing more BME people right now. And I think that's a, a kind of a, a, a thing to remember as we go forward. So I'm gonna take a, a round of questions um, uh, for the panel. Um, so this one is from YouTube, from Carol, and uh, it is the tracking and testing centralized system is awash with private corporation private corporations so how do we tackle that and another one that links to that is what role has privatization played in the problem securing ppe and ventilators during the covid-19 crisis so those two on private corporations meddling and making a mess of things. We've touched on some of this, but especially we've got uh, looking at the PPE stuff and ventilators. So if anyone would like to jump in on those, uh, I will. be great. So I'll take Laura on that first. Yes, please. I know I've, I know I've only stopped um, speaking, but I just wanted to come in on the, um, the, the last point and just tell you quickly about a company who are local to where I am and they contacted when right at the start of this when um, the government put out that plea for if anybody can help us with with uh, getting PPE get in touch with us and they did you know great local company they've won awards for, for uh, various things they got in touch with information about PPE that could be sourced and could be there and could be over with people really really quickly um they didn't get back in touch the government so the pe these people they pushed and they pushed and they went to their mp not interested and the fact is because they wanted the people who they wanted to get those contracts because there are a lot of people making a lot of money out of this how do you solve it how do we solve the fact that these horrible private companies are making money out of it you have to get rid of the tories and you've got to force whatever government that's in um, to make sure that that isn't a priority. Now, sadly for me, we had that opportunity and we lost it. Um, and, and I'm devastated by that because it could have been very, very different. So I think as a movement, we have to put that pressure on people, on the people in power, the people who have uh, have the ability to influence and make them U-turn. involves getting professional footballers to do it, then so be it. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Anyone else like to come in on that one, John? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, on the uh, on the track and trace. I mean, mm. I, th I think the, the the immediate thing is obviously we've got a, a, a Tory government that's only just been elected. We're not going to be able to change that. What we can do is expose time and again what's actually going on and try and get that as far and wide as we can, and make them pay a political price for what they've done. And at the same time, I think we have to recognise and also expose the fact that. A large amount of the track and tracing that actually is being done at the moment is being done by local government professionals and not by the uh, the companies that have been brought in at all. And uh, and the reality is that they've had, they're, they're going to have to get that expertise on the case. Otherwise, these these teams are not going to be able to do it do, do a reasonable job. And although it'd be us sati politically satisfying, I suppose, for us to score a point on this, there's there's actually lives at stake here. We actually want to make this. We have an interest in not allowing this to fail. So we have to keep the pressure on to make sure that the local government experts who do track and trace on a regular basis and actually know how to do it and know their communities are actually brought in to actually work alongside and, 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 and where, wherever possible, take over all the responsible roles from these private companies. It might take a little while to do that, but we have to keep the pressure on everywhere we can because this is not just a, a point scoring exercise. This is actually crucial for us, for our health and for our, our families and so on. So we need to make sure this is actually got right. On the ventilators, I think the other shocking thing is that they, they, they continue to be obsessed with the ventilator question long after the medical professionals began to realise that most, most of the cases are be better dealt with without the ventilators and with other, 
other forms of, uh, of, of, of assistance for breathing, particularly CPAP machine, which I personally have one already, uh, but uh, uh, the CPAP machines, which uh, are much better at just keeping the airways open, but don't have the, the side effects and the long-term effects of, uh, of the ventilators. So I, I think, again, we've got an obsession with that, with bringing Dyson and all kinds of companies in to do this. When actually, again, the, the companies with the expertise in doing it weren't actually the first ones to be, be brought forward. And in the longer run, the question is why, why weren't there sufficient ventilators available to actually equip hospitals? And why was it that when they then produced the new Nightingale hospitals, they put ventilators in them and then stripped out staff from NHS hospitals, uh, frontline services there, in order to run what turned out to be a completely redundant service, stand around for a couple of weeks until they realized there were no patients and, and, and then finally closed them down again. So anyway, there's, there's more stories on all these things and we could, each one of these could be a discussion in itself pretty much. Mm. Brilliant, thanks guys. Lara. Yeah, following on from um, what John said, I think um, privatization has had a big, big impact um, on just how people care for patients in general, whether that's outsourced, you know, scanners and the, you know, the way that they approach patients in a different way to how medical professionals might do it. Um, and I think, yeah, with the PPE and the ventilators, it was just such a stark realization that the productivity in this country is so low and like, you know, Britain just doesn't make anything anymore. And you compare sort of our productivity and things to other countries in Europe and it's shockingly bad. And um, I think this is a, a, di a bigger, deeper problem. And um, yeah, with the, with the Nightingale Hospital, was it, it was just, they made all these ventilators, like you say, and then when doctors were saying, not only do we need CPAP and other things, but people who, you know, it's not an intensive care. If people need their kidneys or other organs supported, they couldn't go to a place that just had ventilators. Um, so, you know, sending someone to the ITU isn't the same as what they were doing in the Nightingale. So it's almost like they weren't, something was not being communicated there. Um, and then there wasn't even the staff to, to staff it. As you say, they were taking away from where they were needed. So just that just shows a lack of focusing on patient care primarily first. You know, you've always got to ask about priorities in healthcare and it's got to be about patient safety, patient care. <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me and while we have private companies involved in key decisions in our nhs that never will be the focus you're never going to have a private uh you know a, a system of fragmented private companies who agree just on patient care like there'll always be a profit motive and that is just not the way to best get best outcomes i think we should have looked at what other countries did like spain in terms of their private hospitals and how they nationalized them so quickly or i don't know exactly what happened but you know just the political will to say actually no we are going to, to, to take over these hospitals or whatever um and i think fundamentally we need a massive change in even you know the civil service and the way that healthcare is provided in this country that like profit is just should not be part of how we deliver healthcare um, all the way through pharmaceuticals social care supply chains um and i think people have started to realize in this crisis that healthcare isn't just doctors and nurses it's the supply chains of the ppe it's this you know all the stuff we've been saying cleaners oh suddenly people care about cleaners because the hospital has to be clean you know and and free of covid yeah well we knew that cleaners were vital in providing healthcare but it's like it's then they're not seen as politically important and and it's just shown how much of this country is used to deliver that healthcare and how how important it is that it cannot be in the hands of private companies brilliant thanks guys i mean of course essential workers are always essential workers aren't they uh sonia do you want to come in as well oh you're still muted. yeah yeah yes just following on from all the speakers um and about and i agree with laura there about taking we, we can't have you know, profit in healthcare. Um, and also I think what people don't sometimes realize when we, when we introduce the market into our NHS, it's, it brings in so much unnecessary bureaucracy, but it also means that we can't, and this has been really exposed in the past couple of months, how 
it stops different services from working together. So it's really fragmented our healthcare system when you have such a disjointed system. And when, particularly when you have a pandemic like this, you need services to work together. And having that market in the NHS really stops doing that. So it's important, I mean, the market for all those reasons mentioned, but also for a fully functioning healthcare service. We can't have, you know, this, this artificial market, which wastes money, is bureaucratic, but also fragments care. Um, and then I agree with everything that's been said about Nightingale. I think it's been a complete joke, to be honest. Um, so they had this thing, they essentially said, you can bring a patient to Nightingale, but you had to, they were trying to basically poach staff from London hospitals, which were already short, particularly of intensive care staff to do it. So it shows their priorities there. And then also, they, if you look at the criteria, this was when I was working um, in the A&E department, so it might have changed, but the initial criteria to be admitted, you essentially could be old, could be young, you could be pregnant, and um, you couldn't have any health problems. Um, so essentially they were only taking the most well patients from London hospitals. So I think they were, they, it seemed to me as if they were trying to make their figures look much better compared to the rest, rest of hospitals. So I think that's quite telling there. Um, and then I guess back to the question about um, why we were using Serco and, you know, and actually there wasn't ever a reason for us to be using these private contractors to do track and trace. We have a public health system in this country. We've got, as, as John said, we have that expertise there and we have great expertise in our public health um, body. And also we have the infrastructure there. So I don't know why they, we weren't using like GP services, for example, to do the testing and all that. So actually, you know, it, it, the only reason that they did this was for ideological reasons. We really need to expose that. As we expose the flaws, and they are going to be massively cocking up, we've seen that already, we also need to expose that they did this purely for ideological reasons um, and for profit-making for those companies. So that really needs to be, I think, at the forefront of our campaigns going forward. Brilliant. Thanks, Sonia. Okay, uh, I'm going to take one more round of questions. But before I do that, just a reminder that the next Arise... Uh, festival session is this Saturday uh, on June the 20th at 3 p.m. and it's called Class Politics After COVID-19 and that's a Tribune event at Arise and that features Richard Bergen who knows needs no introduction, Amy Fletcher who is a secondary school teacher and a rep for the NEU who have obviously done fantastic work recently and shown a real uh, example of how to organise it in these times to every other union. Andrew Murray, author of The Fall and Rise of the British Left, and Faisal Youssef, Foundation Doctor and Active BMA and Unite member. So that will be a fantastic meeting. That's 3pm uh, is the next Arise thing on Saturday the 20th. That's this Saturday. So, final round of questions. Um, a lot of questions have come in about two things. Uh, uh, so one from Keith on Zoom, who's asked, uh, what can we do to counteract Tory policy of further advancing privatisation? And Candy on YouTube has asked, uh, how confident can we be uh, in the new Labour leadership to reverse the onslaught of privatisation? So uh, two main things, really. Uh, so this is a question about... What can we expect from Labour right now in the current situation? And what can we do there? Uh, what can Labour do there uh, to keep good policy? And what can we do to take the fight to the government and win on privatisation, uh, working with uh, groups like Keep Our NHS Public and We Own It and People's Assembly and Health Campaigns Together and so on and so on. So um, a broad question there really about contract, counteracting advancing privatisation, how do we fight, how do we win? Lara, good to see your hand straight away. Um, yeah, so I think in terms of privatisation, obviously it's a massive question, you know, not an easy answer. How do we solve privatisation? I'm not sure there's a, a one word answer. However, it's imperative that we do do that. And I think a lot of this comes down to a local level as well. Um, and I'm, I'm sure Laura will agree sort of as a local council, you can often see, you know, certain contracts happening with your local hospital and all that kind of stuff, like direct action and, and protests and things against that. It's so important working with local unions, you know, like GMB have done some excellent work working with outsourced workers, especially around the ISS stuff, which I know has been written a lot about in Tribune and other places, just some of the, the fact that, GMB were providing, you know, a food bank like services on the workers and in they're paying less than the living wage in London and all this. So um, I think 
if you can get involved with like local campaigns that are ongoing or need to be started, it's often a lot more tangible than such a big question. Um, obviously, we should be fighting at a national level as well. But um, I think that's really important. I think trade unions are really leading the way on that. Um, and I think, yeah, Sonia raised a really important distinction earlier about like the zero hour worker working next to someone on like six figures. Like, I think that is the reality of hospitals in the NHS and whether you work in the NHS or outside of it through trade unions, you can, you can help fight that battle. And I think it kind of leads into the next question about the labor leadership. And I think that is such an important question for us on the left. Again, it's, it's often a tangible thing that we think we can change more while we do, while we are in opposition we can be an opposition that is strong. We don't have to just be waiting for the next government. And oh my goodness, I want a Labour government so much. But um, there's so much we can do in opposition. And, you know, people always say things about Jeremy Corbyn, but the amount of U-turns that he forced um, during his time as opp opposition leader was amazing. And we need to be doing the same thing. Um, you know, we've seen we've seen what happened today, which will, you know, this is not a political point, as, as has been mentioned, this is people's lives, this is food in kids' mouths kind of stuff. And we need to be running really focused campaigns on these issues. I think John Ashworth obviously is like good continuity as the Shadow Health Secretary, but I think we need to be a little bit stronger about our post-coronavirus plan and, and sort of uh, what the Labour Party's vision is if we were in government. Um, I think we can be better. I think that means, you know, in your local Labour Party, passing motions around full nationalisation of the health and social care system. Like, I do honestly believe that that's a policy that might get forgotten, social care, in terms of, like, nationalisation. And we might resort to just, like, tweaking around the edges and not, you know, not actually going back to, like, the roots of the problems in social care, proving it's an unsustainable model um, and reversing it. And you know, we made some good strides on that and I don't want to go backwards on that. So I think, you know, getting involved at a local level in your Labour Party and, and making sure um, your voice is heard. Obviously, like at an NEC level, we are talking about how we make policy in the Labour Party. And that's something that like me and other NEC members would really like to hear about because often policy making in the Labour Party feels very far away, especially when shadow cabinet members make the decisions and then ignore conference policy and just all that shenanigans is not an easy question, but it's something that I have said for ages and ages and ages that the NEC needs to prioritise talking about and changing so that local members feel like their voices are actually heard in policy that they pass, otherwise people start to begin to feel a bit helpless about what they can do. Um, but yeah, there's a lot we can do in opposition in your trade unions and the Labour Party. Um, but yeah, we have to get involved. Absolutely. Uh, Laura, then Sonia. Yeah, I mean, Laura's kind of uh, summed it up, definitely. I think um, the point that I made about don't leave it to the politicians in Parliament that that's key really i think all too often we kind of look to parliament um i certainly did um to kind of lead the way and and the truth is people need to realize the power that they have they really do um as i say when i was a school cuts campaigner we uh we we had a protest here we had like nearly two thousand people um that was just me as one person who started that this area you know we haven't had a protest here since the peasants revolt so it's not something that comes naturally to the area. But if you organise um, in your community, get your voice heard. We've seen great examples of it already. Uh, the Black Lives Matter campaigns are, have been you know, phenomenal. I can't wait to go out and join them um, as soon as I can. And, and again, you know, this U-turn that we've seen, that is absolutely huge. Um, and we can get more of that and embarrass the government into doing it if people know the facts and it is it is uh, put to them, you know, in in the in the simplest way, then uh, then they will become educated and they will react to it, and that's what we've seen. Um, so we need to make the most of that, and just keep keep cam keep campaigning, keep some hope, keep some faith, and the power of people. That's what I'd say. Don't wait for politicians; they'll let you down. <laughs> Fantastic. Sonia, you ready to come in? Yeah. Um, so, am I on mute? Yeah. Um, so I agree with everything that's just been said. And I think, you know, 
I think the last election showed us that the Tories care, or Cummings Tories cares more about being in power than their own ideology. Um, and actually, I think, as I said, we know that the majority of the British public are against NHS privatisation, right? Whenever that's mentioned, there's, you know, all polls show that. Um, and yet, we know that privatisation has been happening and the Tories have just been voted back in. And I think something we often miss here is actually a lot of the privatisation and the outsourcing that's happening in our NHS happens covertly. Um, and actually, I think a lot of NHS workers themselves don't understand and see how this privatization is happening because often like outsourcing happens but these services they will still have the NHS branding on so I remember when I first kind of became realized about this that you know I was working and actually I was a medical student at the time and um, and the service that I was working in dermatology service was taken over I think by circle and um, but you wouldn't have known because it still had the NHS label in so I only found out because of you know my consultant left the job because he like you know he's like I'm not doing this anymore and um, but I think so exposing it is one thing but I also think we need to um, have have human stories show the impact of it. So, for example, like, you know, the Amy department I used to work in, essentially everything was outsourced. And I, I remember talking to my mum and I was like, you know, our, our transport services have been outsourced. And she was like, you know, does that matter too much? Um, and it was, the services were outsourced to a parcel company. And, and the words of one of the, the, the workers there told me, he goes, you know, they, they treat patients like parcels. Um, and actually it was true. And, and you know, there was, I think, I think, you know, countless number of cases but you know my elderly patients 85 year old woman gets discharged at 4 p.m gets picked up by the parcel company at, at three in the morning and gets dropped off so they don't treat patients like people they treat them like you know like commodities and i think having those real human stories of the impact of, of outsourcing has on people and their families i think will have much more cut through than just having the numbers and the stats because that, that hasn't frankly worked i think in the past few years um and that was it i forgot what the other question was now Fantastic. Yeah, and also I don't, as in having a Labour government is obviously the answer, but we can't wait for that. And actually it's about building public consensus about health movement in the next few years. Um, it, we can't just do it every four years saying, you know, NHS is getting privatised and everyone's like, what are you talking about? Like, I think we need to be building up these stories and this consensus and this understanding now over the next few years. So when the election comes, it's not a new conversation to people. No, that's fantastic. And just briefly to abuse the chair before I bring... John, in uh, one of the ways we can do that is to not just get involved with the Labour Party. I'm from Keeper NHS Public, so that's to you to speak to. But I would urge you to join Keeper NHS Public and get involved with those local campaigns. You know, Keeper NHS Public and health campaigns together have saved hospitals from closure, saved A and E services, and by engaging in all of that activity, just as, as Laura was saying about uh, school cuts campaigns, you can make a difference locally, and that does help grow consensus. Um, I would like to bring John in now to respond to all of those things. John from Health Campaigns Together. Thanks, Tom. Obviously, I endorse that, those, those points, but I mean, and, and, and what people have said. But, I mean, I think, um, I think it's important when we're taking on what is ideologically motivated privatisation, we don't work, work an ideologically based answer because otherwise we will only talk to the people who already agree with us. And I think it's really important that we actually work to, to point to the practical arguments as to why privatisation is a bad thing. Because if we're going to stop privatisation in the next few years while this government is around, then we're going to have to divide Tory MPs the way that Marcus Ashford did and the way that the, uh, the campaign against the immigration health surcharge managed to do and actually forced the government to change track, at least for NHS staff, they, they, and at least for some of them, they dropped that charge. And, and so we can see that it can actually work. And we can see the Johnson government, despite its 80 majority, does not feel as strong as you might expect to actually carry things through in the teeth of, um, of substantial opposition. But we've got to create that substantial opposition. And I think particularly if you're looking at the question of people being treated in private hospitals, there will not be a big kickback against that because people will be relieved to be treated at all. They'll be relieved to be in a hospital, which is a small one, which is unlikely to have a COVID infection in it uh, and so forth. So that what might be a natural re revulsion against privatisation as, as such probably won't apply in that way. Now, if we're going to make a case against that, we have to explain what's, what's wrong long term for our NHS in doing that. We have to explain a, a real 
clear case. Like we're just talking to a neighbour or a, a, somebody down the pub and explaining the case, rather than we're talking to a colleague in the Labour Party or somebody already in a trade union and active. We need to actually explain it from those kind of in that kind of way. So I think it's really important we start to develop that kind of language in the way that we present privatisation, explain it, and that we also build the broadest possible alliance to get those points across. And we reach out as far as we can to our right. We want some Tories on our side. We want some late Liberal Democrats, insofar as you can find any, on our side. You know, we want some, 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 some. We want, uh, you know, people who are no, 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 no party allegiance at all. People who realise they voted the wrong way in December. We want them to come on our side and actually be part of this fight to make to, to stop privatisation. And in terms of what Labour should be doing, I think there's three big things. Firstly, we want them to be demanding upfront and really fighting now hard for a public inquiry before it's too late to start to expose some of these mistakes before it's too late and before, while it's still a chance to actually put some of them right. We want a public inquiry. And that should include trade unions and it should include people from campaigning backgrounds as well as simply uh, some scientific experts and so forth on, on, on that panel, not simply be a, 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 a lash together of Johnson's cronies of one sort or another. Secondly, we want Labour to start to develop its own or work with us around a rescue plan for the NHS to put it back together again, to get the full comprehensive service running back together again. And I think that means saying no to any return to austerity in terms of funding for the NHS, both in capital to actually remodel some of our hospitals so they can work with the new situation, and also in, re in, in revenue to ensure that there's no attempt to claw back the extra money that's been spent on, on, on COVID up to now. And, and just as part of that, I think we need a whole campaign around it. And I think we have here a generational challenge. We have the ruins of an NHS that's actually been brought to its knees by the COVID epidemic. In 1948, we had the ruins of, 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 of a mixed economy that had collapsed, bankrupt hospitals, a wrecked economy, and the NHS was formed. And the NHS, the generation that formed the NHS, are now the people in our care homes. They're the people who are being failed by the, 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 the collapse of the NHS now and, and the care system. And we need a new generation now to take on the fight to actually rebuild our NHS. And Labour should sign up for that. And Labour should make that an appeal right across the board come on board with us let's fight to put pressure on this government initially and hopefully as a Labour government rebuild our NHS it's going to take a generation to put it back together again it's going to take a long long time to put it back together again but we have to start now by committing ourselves to the basics of how that should be done Sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you, John. That was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this, you know, the NHS and was formed in what Loach called the spirit of 45. And I think we should have a spirit of 2020. I mean, this is a truly historic, world historical moment. And, and as John said, the death tolls are comparable as well. Uh, so I think it is the time. So, um, Keep our NHS public health campaigns together, People's Assembly Against Austerity, and we own it, uh, as well as supported by big unions and loads of other people and the rise and, and so on, uh, have called for the anniversary on the 4th and 5th of July. Local activity all around the country, sensible, socially distanced, of course, uh, but an online rally uh, at 4.30 on Sunday, the 5th of July which will be on all of the social media platforms and YouTube of all of the above organisations and a whole lot of others. We urge you to join and we'll be talking about our rescue plan and we'll be reaching out to people in the Labour Party and much wider as well and people here to get involved with that. Um, Arise is a fantastic festival of ideas and as I've said already, the next one is on Saturday uh, the 20th at 3 p.m. Class Politics after COVID-19. Please tune in for that one too. I'd like to thank the panel have all been excellent and I think a brilliant breadth of, uh, uh, of ideas, of hope and anger, but useful anger that we're going to turn into campaigning energy. So say thanks so much to all of them and thank you for all of the audience too. Thanks so much. Good night. <laughs>